Thank you for coming out to Exchanging Notes, the interviews. I am John. I have the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of conversing this afternoon with a Canadian artist upon whom many eyes rest, my Andrew Piper. Thank you for dropping into Exchanging yes. Notes. It's Thank a you. pleasure having you. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yes. Andrew. Um, I have to warn you that I'm assiduously prepared today. I actually acquired the services of the research team from the Brian Linehan show. Oh, great. <laughs> it was very cool. They were keeping them in a cryogenic chamber <laughs> in the basement of CBC, right next to William Shatner's sense of humor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, Bill says he never needed it, doesn't need it now. Um, so, I'm going to be asking you some very probing questions. And my first probing question for you is, how's it going? <laughs> you've, been, uh, you've been working for this Piper guy since about 1996. Is that going okay? Have you considered <clears throat> seeking employee elsewhere? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I, I'm unemployable at this point. Um, I, uh, I went to law school, uh, well I graduated in the class of 1995 because I thought rightly frankly, that it was virtually impossible to make a living writing fiction. I never presumed that one could, or more to the point, I never presumed that I could. Um, and uh, to my delight and surprise, I've been, yeah, I've been sort of writing full-time, fiction full-time, uh, for the past uh, 12 years. And so that, that for me, is, is uh, uh, the greatest worry and uh, pleasure of my life, is doing doing for a living what I love to do, and at the same time realizing with each passing year that I'm no good to do anything else but It's this. a good time for Canadian fiction. Can you tell us just a bit about your habits, your work habits? How many hours do you work at a time? How do you, what, bring, what brings you back to the desk? And just generally, what is your day like as a writer? It's full time, but I mean generally the, the mornings are my work time. You are uh, a morning person? Yeah. Yeah, well I just sort of, that's, I don't even know if I am, but that's the, that's the only time, you know, the, it seems as the day goes on, the day uh, uh, invades more, right? There's just sort of, oh, there's a guy at the door. It's the plumber. Oh, yeah, he's here. Um, just, you know how it goes. Yeah. So the morning seems to be the only time and, um, that where you can be assured of some quiet. And uh, so I, I usually, when, when I'm writing, I, I, I work uh, Monday to Friday and I do a word count. So I have to achieve a minimum a number of words per day before I... I'm allowed to have lunch or to. Uh, you are a Protestant, aren't you? Right? Yeah, yeah, well, you see, the thing is, you can go like hours, yeah. as, and as you know, I think we all know, you can sit in a room for ten hours and not do anything, or look at porn if there's a camp, if there's a computer around. But um, you know, it's it's easy to do absolutely nothing, but a word count <clears throat> forces you to actually to, to actually write. Hi, let's talk about, about your that. themes. Let's talk about the lost girls. Um, I talked about regret, complicity, eternal recurrence, victimhood. Um, well, let's give a plot synopsis. In Lost Girls, uh, a lawyer who is probably not amoral, immoral, moral, as, as much as he is pre-moral, uh, goes up north to get the job done. Man's guilty, but he's going to get him off anyway. Changes his mind, decides to convict him. A man who seems to do what is necessary, but a man who is so uncomfortable with himself that he doesn't like to look in the mirror. And a very interestingly named man, Bartholomew Crane, B.C. B.C. What's this? <laughs> it's not a good way to spend Easter. Let's, tell, let's talk about the themes. Did I hit the themes right? Com regret, sure. complicity. Did I, is there anything I missed? Oh, I got it. I'm the last one to to ask, uh, I, you know, it's um, it, that book has been around for 12 years, and it's um, it's in it's in your hands, in your hands now. Uh, I'm I'm actually writing the adapting the book right now for a screenplay. How is that? Well, it's interesting because I, I kind of uh, set out uh, um, to not reread the book. I, I'm adapting the screenplay based on my memory of the book, <laughs> and awesome. and that's it does, that's a 10 year old memory now. You know, it's uh, I haven't reread the book for at least 10 years. Um, and it's interesting how, why, the reason I did that was to not uh, ask myself the questions, that, the question you just asked me, yeah. because uh, those sort of questions, are, while interesting, are uh, uh, the enemy to um, what's the story. Well, let's talk about your memory of the book then. 
Yes. Memory is best served by a bad translator, I think you once said, or Walter Benjamin said, or you said for Walter Benjamin. Uh, I, I quoted Walter Benjamin. Say. Now, what do you remember of the book? What, what strikes you about the book? If you could say in one word, uh, The Lost Girls is about this, what would that word be? Well, I think, I think it's about forgiving yourself. It's mm -hmm. about uh, accounting yeah, I mean, for something. In you've the been past. doing this. I mean, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the uh, the killing circle for a while. Uh, it shows sort of a swifty and satiric edge. Patrick Rush, uh, failed novelist, joins a writer's circle. Everybody's reading weird stories. There's a general atmosphere. People wanting to trust, but really mistrusting. Uh, there's a dream. Bodies show up. Um, everybody says writers shouldn't write about writing. You know that, right? Oh yeah. Why did you write about writing? Yeah, that's, I know. I made a promise to myself I wouldn't be a, someone who wrote a, a novel about writing. Um, but I didn't. I don't think I did. I think I wrote a novel about people, about wanting to write. Um, this isn't, The Killing Circle is a, you know, Patrick Rush is a, he's a journalist, but he's uh, essentially a failed journalist. Uh, and he wants to write a story, but he doesn't have one. And he joins a writing circle where uh, we don't really learn very much about what the people in this circle are reading uh, or what they're working on because it doesn't really matter. And then there's one member of the circle who does seem to be creating stories of, of some interest, Angela, a young woman. But we come to learn that these aren't really stories, that they are, in fact, kind of stolen lives. She is a particular kind of villain in that she, uh, she kills not to kill, but she kills to absorb the lives of others, right? So she's kind of a monstrous plagiarist. She's a, she doesn't just take your story, she kills you. Is she the master narrative that absorbs all stories? Is that what she is? Is that, um, is that what you're doing? I think, she, I think she's kind of, uh, well, she's some kind of embodiment of that, that need to, oh, I really want to write, but I don't have a story. Well, when you're faced with that paradox or that, that dilemma, imagine saying, well, I'll make one up, but make one up through actions that are so diabolical. Um, that, that that is the story, and so no one really tells a, 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 an honest to God made up story in the Killing Circle. They either uh, feel that they don't have a story, or they're stealing someone else's. So uh, I feel I got around. It's not a novel about a novelist. Um, it's about the currency of story taken to a really uh, nightmarish extreme. Eternal themes of Andrew Piper. Andrew, we're going to wrap up, but I'm going to ask you. One last question. Now, uh, Kafka. Kafka said a writer's greatest desire is to narrate his own funeral. Uh, w. C. Fields, one of the smartest men the tour in England ever produced, thought he had a way through that. W. C. Fields proposed that his headstone inscription read, all things considered, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. <laughs> now, we've been talking about your past, we've been talking about your present, we've been talking about your future, and you've given us some very personal answers, and I thank you for that. What would you like your inscription to read? Gosh, um, probably just a good father. Really? Yeah. Andrew, that's very touching. Well, it's way more, it, I, it's way more important than writing. It's way more important than anything. Yeah, Andrew. Andrew, you've been wonderful. Thank you for your coming to exchanging notes. My pleasure. Thank you. Question? Hi. Um, well, I have lots, but I'll just keep it to one because it's one of my favorite poems. Um, it's called Bloody Sunday. In terms of discerning between the forms, I, for me it's, it really is kind of a gut feeling that some stories seem to want to be uh, a, a film uh, and others seem to want to be a novel. For example, uh, 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 I've actually been working on a, uh, I've been hired to, to write a, a TV drama pilot for the CBC and it's about, um, it's about, generally speaking, it's about spies. And so that was the job, this is a job that was given to me, and it's like, there, now go. Uh, and in that case, that could never be a novel, right, because it's a procedure, you're going to tell a different story every week, and essentially my job is to design the framework, the characters, what are they going to do each time, what are the rules? 
And so that would never really, that would never, by its very structure, would not be a novel. But, um, and then uh, conversely, there was an idea I had, uh, you know, what sort of six months ago, and I thought it was going to be the next novel, but it just didn't, it just didn't want to be. It was just kind of like trying to, you know, sort of push a raccoon into a picnic basket. It was like, kept jumping out. And, and, they don't uh, jump out. No, they bite you in first, yeah. and then they jump out. We've pitched that as a, as, a, as a TV series because, again, it just sort of seemed to, the story itself called for a particular form. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, I don't know, I mean, that's a very uh, uh, sort of a, a, a amorphous answer, but I think it, that the, pay attention to the story because the story will tell you what it wants to be. Um, and in terms of the different writing, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the you know, writing a screenplay, and I'm no expert, I'm, I'm relatively new at that, at that racket. Uh, but I like writing screenplays, actually. They're very, um, you, you can't say this to uh, film producers because they think it's very uh, important and they uh, pay you to sort of go away for six months because they think it takes that long and I sort of go away, go away for two weeks and then hang on to the thing for five and a half months <laughs> and then say, oh, that's just about killed me. Um, but it's, I, I find it really easy, you know, once it, it's all structure. Uh, screenplays are, I mean, it, novels are structure too, but they're also 517 other things. <laughs> Whereas a screenplay is just structure. People think screenplays are a dialogue. It's, they're not. They are, it's, it's all the bones of the story. The dialogue is actually, uh, you know, per, David Mamet, who's a pretty good screenwriter and playwright, said, you know, the perfect screenplay would have no one say anything. It would be a silent movie. Because you would just understand from people's actions, the things they do, the sort of the envelope they trade, the, the, the kiss they have, you, you understand the entire story without any snappy lines. And so, that's, I, 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 you know, um, I don't, I'm not writing a silent movie, but um, as close to that as you can come, it's sort of as close to pure structure, just pure storytelling. And that's great. I mean, the hard work there is, is, is in the architecture. The actual writing of a screenplay shouldn't take long. Thank you all for coming out. I've had a blast. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.